Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, hi everyone. Welcome to um, UTMS Study Group's workshop series, crash course workshop series. Um, and if you're new to this series, this is basically a series of workshops more focused on the applied aspects and also as well as introduce the concepts. So sort of like, it'll be different from just a workshop that just in explains the concept. So we try to look a bit more at examples, um, labs as well. So just um, to offer a different perspective. Um, and then in this workshop, we'll be looking at applications of autoencoder. Um, so autoencoder is a really interesting, I'd say, neural network. Um, so sorry, just admitting someone. Um, yeah, it's a very interesting neural network that we'll introduce and explore today. Yeah. Let me go on to the next slide. Yeah, so before we get into autoencoders, um, I think it's best to start with unsupervised learning first, um, since autoencoders sort of fall into the umbrella of unsupervised learning. Um, so in machine learning, there's unsupervised learning and there's also supervised learning. Um, and then today we'll be looking at unsupervised learning. And what it is, is basically, um, it doesn't have labels. And what it means is, um, let's say we have a data like this. So you have apples and watermelons. Um, typically, um, when, you, when you train using supervised learning, you have sort of an answer key and we call those labels. So for Apple, you, if you have an image of an apple, then there's also a label to it saying that it is an apple. But with unsupervised learning, you don't know the labels. So that, that's sort of the twist in this. Um, and, but so if we don't have labels, why is it still useful, right? So, um, so why? It's because um, sometimes there's no labels available. So um, like if you just have some random data set and it's possible that you don't know how many different types in this case, you don't know how many different types of fruits there are, um, then, or other cases where you just don't know the answer keys to the data, right? Then um, this might come in handy. Um, uh, also, um, if you want to have labels, it's also kind of costly sometimes because you have to, let's say you have a data set that, um, you just have pictures of these fruits, for example. Um, and then maybe you have to go through everything and then label one by one. And that might be costly. So um, if you can just go without labels, it's much more easier, right? And um, I'd say an important part of this is also, this is able to extract the data features. So it's able to learn the structure of the data, which is very interesting, right? So you can see in this um, image here, you have the input data um, and then you have the model here and it's able to sort of find the structure between, in this data without you knowing the label. So it's able, able to sort of cluster this into two different clusters, which is what makes it potentially useful. Yeah, so that's unsupervised learning with no labels. Um, and then let's take a look just uh, at an introduction of an autoencoder. Um, so th this is a pretty like, big overview. Um, basically on a higher level, um, what an autoencoder does is, um, so first of all, it's a network that's used in unsupervised learning. So that's why we discussed it here. Um, and it's also an artificial neural network, um, which I'm not going to go into too much detail. Um, so it's an art artificial neural network, ANN, that 
has an input and then it'll, its output will be quite similar to the input, which is <laughs> kind of interesting. Um, and how it does that is it has an encoder part and a decoder part. And this encoder section, it compresses this input into code. Um, so this code is sort of like a summary, as I put here, or just a lower dimensional representation of this input. So that's why it's called a code. And then this decoder part, it's able to take that code and then it reconstructs it. So you can see it's, in this example here, it's using the MNIST digits, the classic MNIST digits data set, and it's sort of reconstructing this. So that's the big overview of um, what happens with an autoencoder. And yeah, next we'll look a, dive a bit more deeper into its architecture. You know, so like, I, like I mentioned before, this is an artificial neural network, so, uh, but it has a unique structure like this. Yeah, so in ANNs, um, if you're interested in the details, we went through the details for ANNs a few workshops ago. Um, so if you're interested, feel free to check out the recordings for those. But basically in ANNs, you have, so in this it's represented in using squares. So these squares are basically neurons that perform a set of computation. And then you also have these weights in these neurons. So that's the parameter you tune in order to optimize your prediction. So this is the this is structure. And what makes an autoencoder unique is that it's symmetrical, as you can see here. So um, this part here is the encoder. And then you can see the code, it's, um, it's a lower dimension, right? And then you, the decoder part can reconstruct and generate the output. Yeah. Mm, yeah, and there's also different parameters that you can tune for this. Um, so just to have some, some variation. So this code size, um, pretty important, I'd say. You can control its dimensions. Um, and then, yeah, I guess with when you vary this code size, then it will also sort of change the information, the feature that you code, right? And then, um, of course, with other structures as well, when you're training, you can change the number of layers. And then you can change the number of neurons per layer. And that'll change the computations that you do, right? Yeah. And then, but the key thing here is it's symmetrical, which is what makes it really unique from the other ones. Okay, yeah, so that was for just a quick intro to autoencoders. I want to leave some more time for us to look at the more of examples and the code side of code side of this. So um, yeah, this is the example we'll be going through today. Um, we'll be looking at using this MNIST fashion data set. Um, so basically this data set, it uses this company's article images, as you can see here. And there's a, so for the data sets, there's the training set and there's also the test set. And you can see like, it has a lot of samples for each. Um, yeah, more for the training set since we'll be using it to train. And the samples are essentially 28 by 28 grayscale images. Yeah, as you can also see here. Um, and then, you have labels, but um, yeah, we since we're doing unsupervised learning, the labels aren't really useful, but um, it's there in the data set. And if I can click, okay, probably not. Let me, uh, yeah, so this data set is also in TensorFlow as well, which is where I found it. And yeah, I just found it to be really cool. There's a part where you can look at the data. Um, so it has the source information. 
the different classes, how it's split between the training and the test set. And you're actually able to take a look at the, the, the different images, which is really cool. Um, yeah, so these are all bags. I think they're, yeah, it's selected by label. That's why it's all bags, but there's different, yeah, there's 10 different classes and you can see um, the different images, which is quite cool. Yeah, and that's the data set we'll be using as an example today. Um, next for the implementation. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll take a look at this TensorFlow tutorial example as reference. Um, but before we go into the details, um, when you're using TensorFlow or Keras, there's going to be a lot of functions that you can make use of. Um, so I've listed the more important ones here. There's this um, tensorflow.keras.sequential. So this can be used to group the layers. So um, yeah, like before we have these different layers. So you can use this to group the layers into a model. And that model you'll be using to train. Um, there's different layers that you can use. So um, since it's an artificial neural network, we'll be using the dense um, this function, which is basically just a regular densely connected, which means each neurons will be densely correct, uh, connected. So this will represent the different layers. And then you also have um, a function, function that you can call to train the model. So um, yeah, so there's already existing functions and libraries that you can use to construct your architecture and then functions to describe and train your model. So then you can see an example here. We have the original images are like this and the outputs, the reconstructed ones are quite similar. Yeah, as you can see, so this is how it's, able to be reconstructed. Let me, oh, so I can click into it. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, so let's take a quick look at the code. Um, so this part basically just describes the architecture that we saw before. Oh, if I can go back. Yeah, let me. Okay, never mind. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, here. Um, so you have the encoder part. And first of all, this is the autoencoder class, the model, your model. Um, and you have the encoder part and the decoder part. Um, this is the, so you specify the layers here for one for the encoder and one for the decoder. Um, and then you can see the functions. You can specify how many neurons you want per layer, um, different parameters. So yeah, basically the input X, it goes through the encoder and then what's the encoded code will go into the decoder and then you get the output. So uh, this basically just describes what's, um, what's shown in this architecture here. And that's how we describe it in code. Um, yeah, you can compile the autoencoder. And then this is the function that I was talking about, fit. So this will train the data set for 10 epochs. And then um, there's also the testing data that's used here to validate that what we've learned is on the right track. Um, so yeah, here it will learn it. Yeah. And then you can see that um, it's reconstructed the input into this kind of newish image. Um, yeah, which is pretty cool. Um, okay, where am I? Yeah, so we looked at that um, simple example to start. And I think we all might wonder, like if we just take an image and we reconstruct it, 
and then you just get a similar image, then what's the use of it, right? So um, this part will be what we'll mainly focus on today. So the different applications of autoencoders. Um, we'll take a look at three different uses. Um, so first, variational autoencoders, which is sort of um, the, it's a, I'd say more popular um, method of using autoencoders these days. So we'll look, take a look at that. Um, data denoising, so you can use it to sort of clean your data. And finally, um, as you can tell from how we introduced autoencoders, it's able to reduce the dimensions. So that's also an application that we'll take a quick look at today. Um, first, let's begin with um, dimensional LED reduction. Um, so like we mentioned before, autoencoders, it's able to, you have an input with this many dimensions, but when you get the code, it's sort of a summary or a lower dimensional representation of it. And there is something, um, there's a technique uh, nowadays it's called TSNE, it's able to visualize higher dimensional data. Um, I think it's quite popular these days. Yeah, um, which is really cool, right? To be able to visualize higher dimensional data. N now we see more, more data with higher and higher dimensions. So it, it's really useful to visualize them. Um, but sometimes this technique doesn't really work well with dimensions that's too high. Um, so sometimes you can use autoencoders to first reduce the, the dimensions, and then you can use this technique to visualize um, the data. Um, and then there's, um, I saw an article with an example. It's, um, it's sort of not directly related to autoencoders. So autoencoder is only the pre-processing part, but I just found it to be really cool. So. Um, I'll, sh I'll quickly share it so you can see, um, should I, okay, let's go here. Yeah, at first it's, you can see how it's able to um, transform that higher dimensional data into a 2D representation. And this is um, a data set with two different clusters. And this is with three different clusters. Yeah, it's just really cool to see how you can represent higher dimensional data into 2D. Yeah, yeah, really cool. Um, yeah, so that's the first use. And then, yeah, the second use is denoising. Um, so sometimes you might have, well, there's a lot of times you're gonna have a lot of some noise in your image. Um, and that's sort of unavoidable, um, but um, you want to get rid of those noise. In this example, we're sort of, since the data we have here is a, um, it's the MNIST data set, so it's much more cleaner than maybe some, some of the more raw data that we see out there. So if we want to demonstrate it, we have to first add noise into this image. So you can see like, you can visually see as well, there's a lot more noise than the four that we want. Um, and then by adding this noise, you're sort of forcing the autoencode, the, yeah, the autoencoder and the encoder here to learn the more useful features. So it's able to extract out the four that you want here instead of all the noise. Um, so as you go through here, it's able to recover. You can see here as well, it's, um, it took out that noise and then you have something that's more similar to the original image. So that's very, Nice to have, so you, you can clean out the noise in your in your data. Yeah. Um, in 
yeah, we'll also show an example for this one as well. Um, but this time we'll be using, um, it's a different type of all encoder. So there's also convolutional all encoder and convolution is basically, um, yeah, for convolution, we also talked about this topic, I think in the last workshop. Um, so feel free to check out the recording for that if you're interested in the details. But this is essentially just a different kind of computation and it's also able to um, extract key features. So that's why you can also use, um, and th these are the functions in TensorFlow that you can use for this. Um, and recall that it's, remember for all encoder, it's sort of symmetrical. So for convolution, there's also a transpose convolution and that, and this part will be the encoder and this part will be the decoder part. Um, so you can see the images here, it has um, noise added in. And then once you feed it through the all encoder network, you can get back the original image without the noise. Yeah, which is really cool. Um, let's take a look at the code. Um, so you load the data sets and you add some noise into the data sets. Um, I'm not gonna go into too much of the details here, but essentially you load the data, add noise to the data. And then just the noising autoencoder, um, it's sort of similar to the first architecture that we had, but now we're using the convolution and the transpose convolution. Um, yeah, just different kind of computations. Yeah, and you can see there's also the encoder, the decoder. Um, that's the structure. And then you can go ahead and train it. Yeah, TensorFlow is, and Keras is really nice to use. It has a lot of um, predefined libraries available that you can just call. Um, and then you train, you train it here. That this is just printing out the summary of the model. Um, and then finally, as you can see in the slides as well, you can print the original image plus the noise, and then you can see what's happening when it becomes the output. Yeah, it's really, really cool how you can get rid of, rid of that noise. Yeah, so that's the second use it has. So you can, it, it's able to um, extract the key parts of an image and then clean out the noise. Okay, let me just see. Yeah, okay. Um, and finally, we'll talk about variational autoencoder. Um, so this autoencoder, it's able to explore the variations in the existing data, uh, sort of represented in this picture here. And then it's able to generate uh, a desired but altered data. Um, so you can see in the, uh, which one is a good example? So you can see in the previous examples, the output is quite similar to the original image. Um, so then what if we keep, well, not keep, but have some sort of variation in this code here. So this is what makes it really unique. Um, so in a typical autoencoder structure, you have the encoder and you have the decoder. Um, so the input, you encode it into the code and you decode it to get the sort of something similar to the original input. Um, but here when you're this time in a variational autoencoder, the encoder, it's able to produce codes of mean plus standard variation. And what that means is it's instead of, let's say, um, yeah, let's go back to the apples and watermelon example. Um, so you can, uh, if you encode an apple, you might say 
the apple is the color is red, for example, for one of the codes um, in a normal autoencoder. But then in a variational autoencoder, you you sort of putting it in a scale. Um, so that's where the variation come from. So it might be leaning more towards um, the red part of the spectrum. So then now that you have some variation in that code, the decoder can sample from that variation. And that's how um, you can have some sort of altered output. And this is really useful for generating new data, which we'll see here. So these are all um, images generated by this variational autoencoder. Um, so this is the Amnist digit data set as well. You can see it's able to generate some um, twisted um, kinds of digits here. And then this is an example I found. Um, yeah, someone was able to produce altered celebrity images here. Um, yeah, so it's this is uh, really good at generating images. Yeah. So that's the variational autoencoder. Let me check the time. Yeah. Um, yeah, we finished. Yeah, I do have, I found, I also found a tutorial that goes through variational autoencoder, but I think um, there's more math in that. Um, so I'm not sure if I want to demonstrate it today, but if you're interested, there's also um, this. Yeah, we do have a lot of time. So yeah, thank you for listening to the slides and we can discuss or answer any questions you may have right now. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for joining. Um, yeah, you're free to go. Um, and yeah, have a nice rest of your Sunday. If you have any questions, feel free to type it out or raise your hand.